I think we'll start with our first speaker, which will be um, Larry Garrity, who's going to talk about uh, dates and theories of the Exodus. So if we could give him a welcome. Well, as uh, one of the members of the organizing committee for the conference, I certainly want to thank each of you for your participation and honoring us with your presence. It's been a long time since so many eminent scholars got get together to talk about the biblical exodus and its context in history and religious thought. Each of you uh, gives a specialized treatment of some aspect of the topic of the exodus, but my assignment is to just give a brief overview of theories and dates as a backdrop for the rest of the papers. So I apologize in advance if it seems too elementary. Its purpose is not to break new ground, but rather to summarize what I might call exodus dates that I have known. I'll begin with the traditional date in the 18th dynasty, move to the current consensus date in the 19th dynasty, and then even more briefly touch on several other uh, exodus theories, excluding views that it probably never happened, at least in the way described in the Bible. In other words, this overview of dates pertains to a face value, somewhat uh, literalist understanding of the Exodus traditions. That there was a datable event, that we can rely on the round numbers, that Moses had a genuine relationship to the Exodus narrative, and so forth. So let's begin with the traditional date of about 1450 BCE in the 18th dynasty. And of course, this theory begins with the chronological statements in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the key text is 1 Kings 6.1. In the 480th year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. Most scholars would agree that the fourth year of Solomon is around 970, plus or minus a year or two. When you add 480 years to that number, you get 1450. That would put you in the New Kingdom's 18th dynasty, perhaps around the death of Tutmosis III, or some have suggested Amenhotep II. Seems a little bit too good to be true, doesn't it? The usual critical response is that the 480-year figure is based on the tradition that there were 12 generations of 40 years each between the Exodus and the United Monarchy, and of course 12 times 40 equals 480. But modern scholarship also suggests that we uh, should know that 40 years is too many years for a generation, with the usual suggestion that 25 years would be closer to the mark. And if you multiply 12 times 25, that would be 300 years. And when 300 is added to 970 BCE, that would take you back to about 1270 BCE for an exodus in the 19th dynasty. But that is getting ahead of the story. Traditionalists say 1 Kings 6.1 is not only uh, the only chronological datum. There is Judges 11.26 where Jephthah, the Gileadite judge, is in debate with the Ammonites who are trying to retake the Meshore or the Madaba Plains from the Israelites. In response to the Ammonite argument that this theory really belongs to them, this territory really belongs to them, Jephthah says, for 300 years, Israel occupied Heshbon, Aroer, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? Jephthah, one of the so-called judges, is dated to the 11th century BCE, traditionally around 1075. If you take Jephthah's round number, 300 years that the Israelites have been there, and add them to his date of about 1075, it takes you to about 1375, since the Israelites have been in Transjordan, a date that fits the 1450 date for the Exodus, if you consider the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness before entering Canaan for the conquest sometime around 1400, and consider that 300 years is a round number and could go up or down by, say, 50 years. And the traditionalists point out that though it is a round number, 300 is not divisible by a generation of 40 years. In other words, the figures in 1 Kings 6.1 and Judges 11.26 work together to suggest an exodus from Egypt about 
1450 BCE. Does such a date work within the context of what we know about the New Kingdom's 18th dynasty? Following uh, William Shea, uh, one published spokesperson for the traditional date, the answer would be yes. As he says, the pharaohs of this period must be dated as accurately as possible before the attempt is made to associate biblical events with them, because if they have been misdated, then the correlation suggested by the biblical date for the Exodus will be incorrect. The chronology of the 18th dynasty has been established by using three types of data, Sothic cycle dates, new moon dates, and the highest numbered regnal years attested for each of the kings who ruled during this period. Using these data, the following correlations are suggested. Currently, there is a paper, too, in press by Doug Petrovich at the University of Toronto in the Journal of Ancient Egyptian Interconnections, which argues for a traditional dating of the Exodus based on archaeological evidence, inscriptional evidence, and Egyptian dynastic chronology. They would suggest that Tutmosis I fits as the pharaoh who proclaimed the death decree for all male babies. It would have come early in his reign, so it would not have affected Aaron, who was three years older than Moses. He moved his court to Lower Egypt where his daughter would have come in contact with the baby Moses. It is possible that Hatshepsut then would have been the Pharaoh's daughter who rescued the baby Moses who would have grown up during the reign of her father Tutmosis I and her husband Tutmosis II. If Moses fled Egypt when he was 40, according to Acts 7.23, then it would have been late in Hatshepsut's reign when her co-regent Tutmosis III would have begun to assert himself. She might have also been the pharaoh who would have had died while Moses was in exile, Exodus 2.23. We know about the death date of uh, Tutmosis III in March, presumably the time of Passover, around 1450, from the tomb biography of Amenemhab, who served in the Egyptian navy under several pharaohs. The cities of Pithom, and what would later be called Ramses, cities built by the enslaved Israelites, would have been needed as store cities for many expeditions of Tutmosis III uh, who, when he led them into Asia. It is interesting that the mummy in the Cairo Museum labeled Tutmosis III has been estimated to be between 35 and 45 years of age, according to XARM, as well as Harris and Weeks in their book X-Raying the Pharaohs, yet we know that he reigned 54 years, so presumably would have been at least 60 when he died. Could another body have been substituted for Tutmosis III when he was not recovered from the Reed Sea? Now bear with me, I'm merely describing the scenario proposed by current advocates of the traditional date of the Exodus around 1450, and you'll have to judge for yourselves the merits of the arguments and the evidence, considered by most of you, I'm sure, to be an historical fantasy at worst and circumstantial at best. There's good evidence for a two-year, four-month co-regency of Tutmosis III and his son Amenhotep II, who happened to be campaigning in Asia when his father died. He rushed back to Egypt to assume sole kingship, at which time he executed the foreign chiefs that he brought back with him as captives. From a biblical point of view, such an unusual action fits well the action of an enraged son of the pharaoh of the Exodus who returned to Egypt to find his father dead from circumstances perhaps caused by the Hebrew slaves. It's also interesting to note that the first contemporary Egyptian reference to Apiru outside of Egypt comes from this time when Amenhotep II brought back to Egypt from Syro-Palestine some 3,600 Apiru from among his 90,000 captives. Was this to compensate for the loss of Hebrew slaves? The so-called dream stela of Tutmosis IV was taken by previous advocates of a 15th century exodus as indirect evidence for the 10th plague because he was not in line to succeed his father, Amenhotep II. But now that we know more about the sons of Amenhotep II, the suggestion needs revision. There still could have been another son named Tutmosis who died early in the reign of Amenhotep II. The Amarna letters mention the Habiru, some of whose activities would be consistent with what we know about the Hebrews in the early period of the judges, though, as is well known, while the Hebrews could have been Habiru, not all Habiru were Hebrews. I can hear many of you saying that the circumstantial evidence from the 18th dynasty is just that, very tenuous, if not hypothetical, in the absence of more direct statements. Indeed, many objections have been raised to this traditional date for the Exodus, and I've already mentioned the objection that the traditional date is actually based on 12 generations of 40 years each. 
The major objection, however, to a 15th century date for the Exodus relates to the results of excavations at Palestinian cities mentioned in the biblical account of the conquest. Cities such as Heshbon, Jericho, Ai, Bethel, Debir, Gibeon, and so forth. I think the key site of Hatzor can be argued either way. Ad hoc explanations can be supplied for most of these sites, but there's no question that the archaeological evidence is inconclusive at best. Let's move to the consensus date in the late 13th century BC in the 19th dynasty. Pharaoh Merneptah's Israel Stila, around 1220, fixes a date before which the Exodus occurred since it mentions Israel as a people among names that otherwise refer to places in Palestine. We've already referred to the reinterpretation of the chronological datum in 1 Kings 6.1, but it is primarily the archaeological evidence from excavated Palestinian sites that has been used to bolster the current scholarly consensus that if there was an Israelite Exodus from Egypt, it must have occurred sometime in the 13th century, in other words, sometime during the 19th dynasty. Does evidence from Egypt in the 13th century support such a theory? Exodus 1.11 indicates that the Israelites built the city of Ramses for the pharaoh of the oppression. Only two pharaohs before Meneptah bore the name Ramses. Ramses I, who is not really too significant since he reigned less than two years. But Ramses II ruled Egypt from about 1290 through 1224 and is known as a great builder. Obviously, there are competing chronologies for him too. Ramses II's royal residence, P. Ramses, was located in the Delta. At one time, as we heard last night, Tanis on the Taneitic branch of the Nile was thought to be P. Ramses, but the literary evidence relating to P. Ramses does not accord well with Tanis, and there's no architectural and stratigraphic evidence for its existence prior to the 20th dynasty, though there is an inscription of Ramses II mentioning the site. Since 1930, various studies have suggested that Kantir on the Pelusiac, the easternmost branch of the Nile, may be P. Ramses because of the fertility of its surrounding fields, its location on both the land and sea routes to Asia, the existence of a palace of Ramses II there, and the geographical divisions of the city and its surrounding regions that all correspond to the literary references to P. Ramses. Tel al Daba covers quite a bit of terry just to the south of Kantir. As Manfred Bietak uh, showed us last night, the occupation of this site under the Middle Kingdom's 12th and 13th dynasties was brought to an end with a violent destruction. Three Hyksos strata or building phases follow this destruction and the city enlarged progressively through these three periods. The destruction of the third and last Hyksos stratum has been connected with the conquest of Lower Egypt by the early 18th dynasty. At one time, it was believed that Tel Adaba was left un unoccupied until it was rebuilt under the 19th dynasty, thus seeming to lend support to the theory that the Exodus must have taken place in the 13th century during the 19th dynasty. But again, as we saw last night, Bitak's excavations have shown major activity in the 18th dynasty, specifically concentrated on the reigns of Tutmosis III and Amenhotep II, when Tel Adaba was a major palace district port city, trade center, and primary naval base with a squatter settlement surrounding the area. You'll remember the many reasons that Professor B. Tack gave last night suggesting the geography of Exodus reflects the Ramesside period, not to mention the 400-year stela, the Anastasi papyrus, the so-called Israel stela, the four-room house in the 12th century, Thebes, the hill country settlement in Palestine, and so forth. And there are other reasons, too, that have been adduced to support such a theory. Um, one, Egyptian tomb reliefs depict Apiru or Khabiru working in vineyards in the northeastern delta of Egypt. But it may be objected that uh, Albright has pointed out that in the 19th dynasty, there appears to be a drastic reduction of wine jar ceilings that have been discovered. Secondly, Ramses II's military campaign to the Sinai Negev in Transjordan appeared to have taken place in his 18th year. Some have suggested that this could have been a search and destroy mission against escaped Israelites. Third, Ramses II's treaty with the Hittites contains an unusual stipulation. That is, that it was incumbent on the Hittite king that in the event that Ramses, quote, own subjects committed another crime against him, the Hittite king would come to his aid in suppressing such a disorder. 
could this stipulation from Ramsey's 21st year be a veiled reference to the Exodus. Mendenhall suggested that the similarities between the Hittite Covenant treaties and the form of the Mosaic Covenant could be most easily explained if Moses had been in Egypt during the 13th century. Beyond the nonspecific nature of the preceding suggestions, some problems with dating the Exodus in the 13th century arise when the history of the period is examined from the biblical point of view. These problems have to do with the pharaohs involved, the pharaoh of the oppression, who died while Moses was in exile, and the pharaoh who died during the Exodus. It must be said that neither Seti I nor Ramses II work well for the pharaoh of the oppression, nor do Ramses II or Merneptah work that well for the pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, there are many other uh, theories of the Exodus. Having started this paper with a brief discussion of the traditional early date of 1450, and then moved on to the mainstream consensus late date around 1250, I'd like now to proceed very briefly to review the broad range of other proposed Exodus dates in chronological sequence from the earliest to the latest dates. This will be in summary form only because there's not that much time to explore any of these other theories in any depth. And it should be noted that some of the major advocates of those other theories are present today or submitting papers for the proceedings. For instance, Don Redford has uh, suggested possible connections to the ancient stories of a Hyksos or a leper expulsion from Egypt in an event around 650, but he was prevented from leaving his excavation to um, be here today. I want to emphasize that I don't plan to get bogged down in minute arguments over exact years that would be impossible to determine in any case based on our current state of knowledge, despite what some advocates might claim in knowing even the exact day, month, or year. I'll round off the dates to the nearest 50 or 100 years for clarity and simplicity of presentation wherever possible. These proposed dates and theories of the Exodus can be easily seen on the second page of the handout, which Brad Sparks has conveniently put together and which I have duplicated and I think they've been passed out and each of you has a copy. For comparative purposes, one can also look at the first page, which summarizes the main Exodus Pharaoh identifications and theories together with the primary advocates. Number one, the earliest theory centers in the Middle Bronze I or Early Bronze IV, now often called the Intermediate Bronze Age, uh, around 2100 BCE. And of course, there are various tugs on this dating, upward and uh, downward. Primary advocates include Rudolf Cohen, 1983, Emmanuel Nati, uh, 1985, and he's here today. David Neve, Kenneth Emery, 1995, David Alone, 1999. This archaeological period is correlated with the late Old Kingdom and first intermediate period in Egypt, with some advocates connecting the Exodus specifically with Pharaoh Pepi II, Neferkare of the Sixth Dynasty. Some have observed a connection with the report of Artapanus of Alexandria around 200 BC, who described the birth story of Moses as occurring during the reigns of Pharaoh simultaneously ruling a country dividing north and south under Pharaoh uh, Nefikres or Kenefres in the south and Palmenothes in the north. Second, an early and old theory advocated by the chronographer Julius Africanus and the Roman era Jewish historian Josephus put the Exodus in what we would now reckon at circa 1700 BCE in our modern dating system. They based the information on what was known to them at the time about the Hyksos. Third, a theory we will hear quite a bit more about this weekend takes advantage of what the volcanic eruption of Thera, better known now as Santorini, did to the Eastern Mediterranean in Egypt. The correlation of the Thera eruption to the Exodus event was first proposed by the Greek archeologist Angelos Galanopoulos in 1964, then developed further by Egyptologist Hans Gudecki in 1981 and updated in 2004. They put the date of the eruption and the exodus at around the traditional date, first of 1450, and this aroused great controversy due to radiocarbon dating, as well as tree ring and ice core dates now largely abandoned, which point to Thera's eruption at around 1650 to 1600. The new Thera dating has in turn been connected with the exodus by archeologists Henrik Bruins and Johannes van der Plicht in 1996. 
Fourth, uh, Manetho, the third uh, century BCE priestly historian who divided the Egyptian pharaohs into dynasties, believed that the Exodus could be equated with the Hyksos expulsion from Egypt, which he dated to around the 1550 BC, as we would render it in our modern dating system. Uh, Josephus essentially endorsed Manetho's theory, though with a chronology we would now reckon at about 1700 BC or some 150 years earlier than modern reconstruction of Manetho's dates. In 1927, H.R. Hall supported Manetho's view, and many others have followed since Manetho also offered another theory that the Exodus might have coincided with the expulsion of lepers from Egypt in 1350 an Exodus correlation that was hotly disputed by Josephus as anti-Semitic. Fifth, Archbishop Usher, the divine who advocated the date for creation in 4004 BC, in the very same work published in, 18, in 1650, also dated the Exodus to 1491 BCE and, was, uh, and suggested that Ramses Miamum, or Ramses II, was the pharaoh of the oppression. Usher's identification of Ramses, popular at the time, appears uh, totally forgotten today. Sixth, we've already treated a bit more length, the so-called traditional early date for the Exodus around 1450, under either Tutmosis III or Amenhotep II. Notable modern advocates include archaeologist Carl Watzinger, 1913, Egyptologist Eric Peet, 1922, archaeologist Siegfried Horn, 1977, and many others of a more conservative bent to the present time, as I've already mentioned. In 2004, Egyptologist Hans Goedeke suggested the exodus occurred during the reign of female pharaoh Hatshepsut, around 1473 following. Number seven, already in 1849, Carl Lepsius had dated the exodus to 1314 BCE, suggesting, like Usher before him, that Ramses II could have been the pharaoh of the oppression, but roughly around 1400. The dating of Ramses by other 19th century Egyptologists was still higher and led to an exodus date in agreement with the traditional date of the exodus around 1450. As the work of Egyptology progressed, the date of Ramses came down until its identification became the forerunner of the current consensus for around 1250 BCE. Eight, uh, the traditional Jewish date of Rabbi Yosef ben uh, Halafta in the Seder Olam around 160 BCE put the Exodus at 1313 BCE. Nine, again, we've already treated a bit more length, the so-called current consensus late date Exodus of 1250 with Ramses II and Ormenepta as Pharaoh. Most scholars who give any credence at all to an historical exodus from Egypt could be cited as advocates of this theory. 10, David Noel Friedman in 1980 and repeated in 2006 suggested the possibility of an exodus during the time of the Sea Peoples and the Philistines around 1170 BCE. 11, Egyptologist Don Redford, 1992, suggested the possibility of an Egyptian site period Exodus as late as around 650 BCE. So you can see theories regarding the Israelite exodus from Egypt have in modern times been seriously proposed over a period lasting a million, a millennium and a half, quite a wide range for the founding experience of the Jewish people, comparable to, let's say, dating the first Thanksgiving in the first century CE as the founding experience of an American identity. During the remaining days of our conference together, we look forward to the filling out of much of the evidence as well as, dare I say, speculation that surrounds the topic for which we have come together to learn from each other. So uh, on with our schedule. Thank you very much.